The epistle for this feast of the most sacred heart of Jesus is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 8 to 19. Brethren, to me, the very least of all saints, there was given this grace to announce among the Gentiles the good tidings of the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to enlighten all men as to what is the dispensation of the mystery which has been hidden from eternity in God, who created all things, in order that through the church there may be made known to the principalities and the powers in the heavens the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he has accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him we have assurance and confident access to God through faith in him. For this reason, I bend my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom all fatherhood in heaven and on earth receives its name, that he may grant you from his glorious riches to be strengthened with power through his spirit unto the progress of the inner man, and to have Christ dwelling through faith in your hearts, so that, being rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know Christ's love which surpasses knowledge, in order that you may be filled unto all the fullness of God. The Holy Gospel is a continuation of St. John, chapter 19, verses 31 to 37. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. At that time, the Jews, since it was the preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a solemn day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers opened his side with a lance, and immediately there came out blood and water. And he who saw it has borne witness, and his witness is true. And he knows that he tells the truth that you also may believe. For these things came to pass, that the scripture might be fulfilled, Not a bone of him shall you break. And again another scripture says, They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. These are the words of today's Holy Gospel. The Mass this evening is offered up for Joe and Carol Brenner and family. I want to thank the choir for helping to make this a high mass today, as it deserves to be, and also for the servers who got here. On this feast day of the Sacred Heart, the Church asks us to pray uh, before the Blessed Sacrament the act of reparation to the Sacred Heart, which is why those Sheets have been passed out to you, and we're not going to do the entire thing, but just the prayer that says the act of reparation. So we will do that after the sermon with the tabernacle door opened for a minor exposition. We'll kneel down, all of us, and say it together and try to stay together. Another very important announcement is a congratulations to Emily Ryan, Margaret Spaulding, and those of her family and those who came with her today to celebrate and support this beautiful thing that happened starting at around 3.30 here at Our Lady of the Pillar when Emily made her profession of faith, abjuration of heresy, and then she was conditionally baptized, had her confession, her first confession, and then tonight at this Mass, she will make her first Holy Communion. We have planned a little reception for uh, Emily and her family and friends. All of that is particularly for them. That's why we have the reception down at the cafeteria area after Mass. 
but everybody else is invited to come if you want to meander down there. There's not a lot. It's not meant for everybody to make uh, a full meal out of it. So eat like birds, and then everybody will be able to get a little bit. All right. There's also some wine down there and some limoncello in the refrigerator and some lime cello and some little glasses. So those of you who have a long way to drive, be careful about that because it's powerful stuff. But please, everybody is invited to come down and say hello to Emily. Let Emily be the first one to receive Holy Communion tonight, okay? So you'll come up and Michelle, if you want to come with her, you may also. Michelle, prophet was uh, the chosen godmother for that Emily used for her sponsor. On this Feast of the Sacred Heart, what a beautiful day for any Catholic. And what a beautiful day even more for those who are going to join the church and have their first taste of God. Everything good, everything good we have comes down from God from the Father of Lights and through the most sacred heart of his Son, Jesus Christ. The devotion to the heart of Jesus many people believe was first started by Saint Margaret Mary and that is not entirely true. There was one who began the devotion to the hearts of Jesus and Mary a little bit before our Lord appeared to Saint Margaret Mary. He asked her to popularize it and promote it more but the very first one to do that was a priest, a French priest named Saint John Eudes. E-U-D-E-S. And in preparing for this feast day, I, knowing that, wanted to just do some meditations of St. John Eudes on the Sacred Heart. And what I found was not on the Sacred Heart, although I could have, but I stumbled on something before that. And it was so beautiful because it fit in not only with the Sacred Heart, but also with what happened with Emily today and the graces that she has received so far. And I thought, what better than to read just a few of these little meditations from St. John Eude for everybody here. And when I do that, I want you to realize when you're listening to what this saint is saying in the 1600s in France, why don't we hear it today? Why aren't the priests preaching this today and saying these things? Good Lord, we would not have this problem in the church or in society. All of the world would be reformed if every priest in the Catholic Church spoke like St. John Eude. The whole world would be converted. But you hear, hardly ever hear any Catholic priest, not even of the traditional groups, speaking the way St. John Eude speaks. Listen to the truths that he says. The most basic, strongest, foundational truths. And at the same time, realize that none of these are believed by most Catholics today. And many traditional Catholics don't want to listen to them because they're too harsh. Today, we are supposed to have political correctness, not offend anybody. Let everybody have tolerance and believe whatever they want. And good heavens, don't ever offend them by telling them that they're wrong or that they're going to go to hell because they're believing the wrong doctrines. St. John Eudes doesn't talk like that. Listen to what he says. Firstly, when you have been presented to the church to receive baptism, you were treated as a person in the possession of the devil. I was thinking of that today because for the baptism of an adult, there are three exorcisms that are given. And Emily received all three. And this is what St. John Eudes is referring to. 
You know they don't even exercise holy water in the Novus Ordo anymore? It's just a blessing that you may feel good with this water. If you read it one day, you'd be scandalized that there is no power at all in this holy water. I would never trust that holy water from these new Catholic churches. They've suppressed the exorcisms. Why? How dare anybody be told that they've been in the possession of the devil? Or that the devil could occupy you? You're such a good person. St. John Hughes doesn't believe that. When you come into the church, you are treated as a person in the possession of the devil. Because the priest pronounced over you the exorcism of the church, commanding the wicked spirit to depart from you and to give place to the Holy Ghost. You try talking like that to Novus Ordo Catholics today, and they'll shake their head in disbelief. How can you dare believe something like that? He says, this ceremony teaches you that by original sin, you were really in possession of the devil, and that he abided in you, but that through baptism, he has been cast out of you, that your soul has been purified from the horrible stain which disfigured it, and that the Holy Ghost, having sanctified and ornamented it with his grace, comes to take up his abode in it. Fifthly, St. John Jude says, the priest introduced you into the church by saying, enter into the house of God so that you may have eternal life. This ceremony teaches you that baptism enables you to enter into the society of Jesus Christ and of all the faithful who compose the house or family of God. By this entry, you begin to partake of all the good works of the faithful and you acquire a right to the sacraments, to the prayers, and to all the other good works which are done in the church. Moreover, in entering into the church, you have become her child, and have been made a child of God, the heir of God, and co-heir of Jesus Christ. You entered into society and communion with the angels and all the blessed who are in heaven. By this ceremony, you are likewise taught that, in order to be united to Jesus Christ and to have eternal life, uh-oh, here comes the part. I can't believe he's saying this. Can you imagine? Here's a Catholic priest saying something like this. Listen, what he's going to say. In order to be united to Jesus Christ and to have eternal life, it is necessary to be a member of the church and to persevere therein to the end, believing all all that she teaches, obeying all that she commands. How dare a priest teach like that? You mean I can't be saved, Father John Hughes, if I'm not a member of the Catholic Church? That's what he just said. Baptism is the first step that makes you a Catholic. That's just the first of three things that you need. Then you have to believe in all the doctrines, all the teachings of the church after your baptism, and then you have to accept the Pope. Didn't you hear the epistle today? St. Paul mentioned the word church. It was John Calvin who more than even Martin Luther in the so-called Reformation period organized a church. He organized a religion called the Presbyterian religion, or Calvinism, if you go over there. It's the same thing. And he organized a religion in a way as if there had never been a religion established on earth before. As if he was the very first one to establish it. And what did he say? That the church, which is spoken of in the Bible, is an invisible church. There is no hierarchy. There is no pope. There are no priests. Everybody is a priest. There is equality for everybody. Everybody. There is no hierarchy. That's Protestantism. And so to come into the church is an invisible church for them. But Emily knows better now. She is a member of a hierarchy. It's a visible church. And as Jesus said, the church is like a city seated on a hill. How can that be an invisible church, John Calvin? But that's what the church is, Christ said. 
And Emily found that church by the grace of God and by the help of other Catholics around her. Okay. Just imagine, had they told Emily, well, you don't have to become a Catholic to be saved. How many times the Novus Ordo priests tell that to people? The Novus Ordo bishops and our own popes. They're telling people you don't need to become a Catholic in order to be saved. The story is that a woman a couple of years ago went to Pope Benedict and asked him, I'm from Germany, I'm Lutheran, do I need to become a Catholic in order to be saved? He says, go home and enjoy yourself. Enjoy your Lutheran religion. God loves you all the same. St. John Jude continues. So that you may have a true faith in those things which God has revealed, it is necessary that you should believe in the Catholic Church, in which alone you can learn with certainty what God has revealed. For this reason, after you have been asked if you believe in God, you are also asked if you believe in the Catholic Church. Certainly those who do not believe in the Catholic Church, this is St. John Hughes, cannot have divine faith in the mysteries which they believe, but only natural and human faith. A faith of their own fancy, founded on the light of their own judgment, subject to error, and not on the promises of Jesus Christ. The Catholic Church alone possesses these promises, and on her testimony alone rests the foundations of Christian faith. As she possesses the divine promises for all days, even to the end of ages, there can be no reason to doubt whatever she proposes to our belief. Thank God for having given you the precious gift of faith. All of us here, and you, Emily, today, and having made you a child of the Holy Catholic Church, which is the faithful repository of the truths of salvation, and which all Christians are obliged to acknowledge as the true church. In saying, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, you united yourself inseparably to this Holy Mother. You believe without hesitation all that she proposes, as proposed to you by Jesus Christ himself, and who is ever with her in her instructions. Reject then, with horror, everything at variance with her teachings and regard it as an error calculated to endanger your faith. However ignorant you may be, you have the true faith if you believe without exception all the Holy Catholic Church believes and teaches. On the other hand, however learned you may be, you lose the gift and the virtue of faith if you reject any doctrine which she teaches. For her faith is your rule. As there is but one faith, says St. Paul, to wish to divide it is to destroy it. Heretics not only differ from the church in faith, but they also differ amongst themselves, a proof that they do not have the true faith, which is one. The Holy Catholic Church never has suffered and never will suffer a difference of faith in regard to any article. Her faith is the same in all times, in all places, and in all true children her true children. Thus her faith is one and the only true faith. You should be most desirous to preserve the faith in all its purity, since without it, it is impossible to do anything which merits heaven. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Those who do not possess faith may practice all the moral virtues, including justice, sobriety, chastity, alms deed, prayers, mortification. And not only is this the case with heretics, but it's a truth which should be borne in mind that these good actions, unless they have faith for their principle, will never merit heaven for them. The law of Moses, all holy as it was, could only save those who observed it through faith. When therefore you observe 
that those who believe not in the church practice some good works, offer many prayers, and lead an austere life, do not believe that they are on this account in the way of salvation, unless they have true faith. And then he ends by saying, you commit an enormous sin if you believe that they can be saved outside the Catholic Church, that they can have faith without believing in her, or that they can be saved without faith. Emily today professed her faith. I don't expect that she's going to deny any article of it. I think that she loves her new Catholic religion, and I think that she's going to practice it well, at least in its belief. But you know that in order to be saved, it's not enough to believe correctly, but we have to live correctly. We have to behave correctly. Catholics may believe all the doctrines, but if a Catholic is damned, even though he believes all the doctrines, he's going to be damned because he didn't live well. He didn't behave well because his morals were bad. That's why Catholics go to hell. And the majority of Catholics who do go to hell go there, not because they're in a false religion, not because they disbelieve a doctrine, but because they just didn't live up according to their beliefs. Now, what do you think about that? Bad Catholics. Bad Catholics are the cause of everything that's wrong in this world. Everything. We want to believe, we want to blame Hillary. We want to blame these other politicians. No, it's, it's ourselves. We are the cause of everything. Because we are the only religion that has the truth. And God blesses the world through us. And when we are bad, the world is not bad. It says by one of the saints that when God wants to punish a people, he gives them bad priests. He doesn't rain down thunder and lightning on them and cause earthquakes. He gives them bad priests. That's the worst kind of punishment that there can be. Priests who don't believe. Priests who don't care how you behave how you dress, how you entertain yourself. Go be free and tolerate everybody in their pagan ways. Live like them. Dress like them. Speak and entertain yourself like them. That's a bad priest. St. Bernadette of Lourdes sometimes thinks of these saints as being just sweet little people who love God and stay in their room and say their rosary all day. Listen to what St. Bernadette of Lourdes said. It's a well-known account. Sister Marie Bernard Subaru Bernadette is in the convent of the Sisters of Charities in Nevers. It's 1870. War is raging throughout northern France on the Prussian-led German front. The armies are marching toward Paris. The first printed version of the account was published while she was still living. And here is the following account. A visitor came to Bernadette at that time and made her the following questions. Did you receive in the grotto of Lourdes, or after then, any revelations related to the future and the fate of France? Did not the Blessed Virgin deliver any warning for France? Any threats? No. Well, the Prussians are at our gate, sister. Does that cause you any fear? No. There is nothing to fear then, she says, I only fear bad Catholics. You do not fear anything else? No, nothing else. Wow. Words of great wisdom from this saint. 
the words that we barely understand. The true enemies of the church, those who can cause Catholics great harm and peril of damnation, are those who are in her own church, those who are within. St. Bernadette feared them. And they are more dangerous the more powerful they are. Today they occupy Rome. The smoke of Satan is there. The church is indestructible because Christ already promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But the enemy has taken over the church. And that's why we are here doing what we are doing and not at the local other churches. Because they have been taken over by those types of forces. The devil is in Rome. And from Rome, the devils have gone out to occupy all the other Novus Ordo Catholic churches that do not believe or teach what we are talking about tonight. The more empowered they are and feel, the more fury they're going to dish out to us. They're going to be deceptive and they're going to be bold in their vulgarity. And we're going to suffer greatly. But we can stop that. So it's very, very good news. It's hopeful that we have somebody like Emily and her family and her friends who are supporting her in this because we have another person who's going to pray and their prayers will be most powerful with God. And especially on this day. There's probably no more day in your entire life coming up when you're going to have more power in your prayers when you receive these extra graces that you're going to receive tonight with the Holy Trinity dwelling inside your soul in your first taste of God in Holy Communion. So pray for me who instructed you and suffered so much in this whole thing. No, it was a delight to be with you. And unfortunately, the instructions usually end. And we have to say goodbye because it's a very long drive down for you and I don't expect you to have to make that drive again. It's time for you to fly the nest and be on your own. But you know where your friends are and you have many friends and your priest is your friend. And pray for me. Pray for all of us tonight and everybody who helped us make this Mass so beautiful on the day of your first Holy Communion. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So let us...